just so that if anyone is not here or we want to post this later, um, they'll have access to this presentation. Um, I want to first start by saying thank you to some of my colleagues who have joined tonight. Um, I'm Andrew Henning with the City of San Rafael. Uh, we're joined by Chief Diana Bishop of the Police Department, Chief Darren White with the Fire Department, Sar Sergeant Carl Huber with San Rafael PD, as well as Lynn Murphy with San Rafael PD, and Neera Doherty uh, with the City Attorney's Office. So um, tonight's agenda is we have um, basically a, a presentation to start off with, um, probably about 25 minutes or so. So you can hear a little bit about this issue from a variety of, of different perspectives. Um, we'll then move to a um, Q&A. And um, if possible, I think we'd like to try to keep the Q&A within the chat. Um, so I'll be trying to moderate the chat and then I'll, I'll kind of triage questions to the right person. Um, and then at the end, I know some people might've mm -hmm. called in. So if you've called in and you can't see the chat, um, we'll save a few minutes at the very end for, for call in questions. Um, in terms of the, the format for tonight, um, it is obviously on Zoom. This isn't a webinar version of Zoom. So uh, in light of that, this is just one big meeting. So um, if everyone could please um, mute your mics, uh, that would be helpful in case there's any background noise. Um, I also wanted to, to let everyone know that we have um, targeted this meeting for neighborhoods specifically adjacent to some of our hotspot encampments right now. It wasn't a citywide uh, advertised meeting, so it was really meant to be more of kind of a small group discussion. In light of that, I don't anticipate any kind of nefarious Zoom activity like Zoom bombing or anything like that, if you've heard of that, uh, where people kind of inappropriately come into the meeting. Um, I did want to stay, say, though, that if that happens for whatever reason, again, I don't anticipate it happening, um, but I will um, try to exit that person from the meeting, or I might have to, depending on the severity of what's happening, just end the meeting and we'll have to have a follow-up. So again, I, I think that's a very rare, slim possibility, but I just want to acknowledge it up front. Uh, so with that, um, maybe just a quick question. Len, did you see any of the lobby activity, or was that only me that could see that? I can't see it. So I, I will try to keep an eye on that, but I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, share my screen. Uh, and we have a presentation to, to kick things off. Um, so here we go. And we'll go ahead and get started. So, um, so again, I'm Andrew with the city of San Rafael. And to, to start things tonight, we wanted to start by just giving you a, a high level overview of, of sort of what the city and the county are doing around homelessness in general. Um, and so I will go ahead and jump in. So I would say our approach to addressing the issue of homelessness really began to shift in 2015. Um, there's a lot more background, which I'm happy to go into detail about, but I think the core insight is that um, at that time, there was a, a lot of issues in downtown San Rafael. A lot of that was centered around the Ritter Center, if you might recall a lot of those conversations. And what we realized through all of that is that in terms of the overall homeless community, there was really a small minority of individuals. Uh, we call them the chronically homeless. So those are people that have been uh, homeless in San Rafael or in Marin for an extended period of time and have some sort of uh, exacerbating issues such as a, a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue. Um, but this group was primarily responsible for a lot of our challenges on this issue. And so when I say challenges on this issue, um, if you were to look at per capita costs of homelessness uh, in our community, um, for people that are chronically homeless, they run about $65,000 per person. And this is emergency room visits and criminal justice interventions. Um, so it, it's very costly to the public for, for these folks to um, be homeless. Uh, in terms of community complaints, as I mentioned, this was really driving a lot of the community uh, concerns about the issue of homelessness. Um, based on some sub subsequent research that we've done in looking at the overall homeless community, only about 30% of people experiencing homelessness in San Rafael generate any uh, 911 police involvement uh, or any kind of 911 calls. Um, so again, it's really a small minority that's generating a lot of the concern. And then lastly, I think, you know, just ethically, morally, um, these are some of the most vulnerable people in the community. And studies have found that these folks pass away on average 25 years earlier than their house peers 
from treatable chronic illnesses that just go unresolved on the street. So for a lot of reasons, this population made sense to focus on. Uh, so what we found is that in Marin, and this is a case, I think in a lot of communities, is that a lot of the focus is on people that are uh, not chronically homeless. And so to put this into context, um, about two thirds or more, even as high as 80% of people that become homeless, it's a one-time brief experience lasting a few weeks or even months um, that often requires a very small intervention to actually uh, resolve that homelessness. And so what I think happens in a lot of communities is there, there's a, a focus on this group that is already likely to self-resolve their homelessness or need minimal assistance. And then the chronically homeless do not get help and then that situation gets worse. And so once we realized this dynamic, we started um, trying to do something about it. So we went on the road up to Sonoma, to the East Bay, the South Bay. Uh, we took our executive leaders from the county, um, elected officials like the mayor and, and our supervisors. And we looked at models that were um, really focused on this chronic homeless group. And so at the same time, uh, we began to also um, trying to map our own system locally. And so the details of this map aren't that important other than to say being homeless is in the middle, being housed is in the outside. And so you can see that back in 2015, 2016, uh, it was a complete maze for people to try to get back into housing. And so the result was that you had people that were inherently difficult to serve because of their behavioral health, their substance abuse, whatever it was, they would fail out of our programs because these programs weren't designed to support those folks. They'd become more distrustful, they wouldn't seek help and they would get worse. And this was the dynamic in our community. And frankly, it's a dynamic all across the state and many communities that haven't really tackled this. And so what we came to, to find through our various tours is that we don't need another program. We don't need another substance abuse program or another mental health program. Everyone that's chronically homeless, just like everyone who's on this call is unique and different and has different requirements. And so, through our various uh, visits, we learned about a program in San Mateo um, that was also designed to address chronic homelessness in downtown San Mateo, where basically all of the major service providers came together around the table every two weeks to work on a by name list of the most high needs vulnerable people. And so that's what we started in um, around March, February of 2016. And uh, we met every two weeks and our philosophy was, let's move past this maze. Let's really focus on housing. Uh, and the results were great. We started housing people. And those first 18 months, we housed 23 of the most visible, disruptive, high needs people uh, that were in San Rafael. And based on that, moving into 2017, um, we came to realize that if we wanted to, to have an even bigger impact, what are models for, for how to do that? And so we learned about an organization called Community Solutions that has a national initiative called Built for Zero that's in now over 80 communities across the country that is using this by name list approach of identifying the most high needs people and then getting them into housing. Um, what's kind of amazing is, so actually today is the three year anniversary of the start of uh, what we call coordinated entry, which is taking that by name list concept and making it county wide. And I can describe more in detail about what that means and how that works. But from 2017 to 2019, at least, using this new system, we saw a 28% reduction in chronic homelessness in Marin. Um, and for the folks that we housed, uh, over 90% of those folks have remained housed. We've now housed, uh, as of today, over 220 individuals that are chronically homeless. Um, for people in San Rafael that were homeless in San Rafael before and after the housing intervention, we saw an 86% reduction in police calls for service. And we also saw a 54% reduction in EMS transports. So this really does work. Um, and again, I'm happy to go into more detail about um, housing first or any questions. So fast forwarding to 2020, um, obviously the big issue that's, that's, I think, changed a lot of our lives in a lot of different ways is, is COVID. And so um, in response to COVID, just to give you an update of what's been happening in the past six months, um, at the height of the pandemic uh, and a lot of the planning around this over the summer, we had actually increased emergency shelter capacity in Marin County by uh, as much as 60% um, to help get people off the street. Um, the county of Marin, as you might know, had passed an eviction moratorium for people affected by COVID. Um, the county 
primarily MCF, but also with support from the city of San Rafael and the city of Novato, uh, created an emergency assistance fund that helped about a thousand households stay housed. Um, we were able to expand hygiene services for folks um, to make sure that they were staying you know, clean and bathed and so forth uh, during this. Uh, we worked with the county to get um, outreach workers out to encampments to make sure people were able to essentially shelter in place uh, or, or get connected to resources or get referrals to the, the motel program. Uh, and last but not least, I do want to say that we didn't, we never lost our focus on chronic homelessness. And what's amazing is last month, and I often get a question of, are we only housing people in San Rafael? Because it, it, I think sometimes that's the perception. But last month, we housed 20 people that were chronically homeless in our community, our best month ever. And part of that was from housing a number of people um, at the new Victory Village housing mm -hmm. development in Fairfax. So that was really amazing and, and a really positive development. Um, and San Rafael, you might have heard that we are also looking at um, a couple of potential housing projects. The Mill Street Shelter over in the canal, they are in the process of um, starting to rebuild that shelter. Um, the idea is to rebuild above the existing site to uh, basically rebuild the shelter capacity, which is about 65 people, and then add 32 new units of permanent supportive housing on top. Um, so that's already been approved, that's in motion. And then recently you might've heard that <clears throat> while Mill Street's undergoing construction for what we call Mill Street 2.0, um, just earlier this week on Tuesday, the San Rafael Planning Commission approved the use of 3301 Kerner, which is caddy corner to the health and wellness campus for a temporary Mill Street replacement um, while, they're, while they're undergoing construction. Um, so that has been approved uh, and is, would likely be occupied, I'd say within the next two months, probably by the end of the calendar year at the, the very latest. Um, so that's in motion. I'm also happy to talk about that. And I also want to uh, be open that um, this site, the county has also applied for funding through Project Home Key, which is a state funding initiative um, to actually make this permanent housing. So uh, at this point in time, um, that project has been waitlisted. It has not received a funding reservation. Uh, and again, I'm happy to go into more detail about how that's going to work and, and, and the vision and so forth. But uh, I just wanted to be uh, open and, and let everyone know that that's also in motion too. Finally, um, and I'm going to not say too much on this because I want to defer to my colleagues, but um, again, I hope you can see that we've made a real push over the past few years to house some of the most vulnerable, challenging folks in our community. The past couple months, we've worked really hard to increase shelter capacity um, while not approving sanctioned encampments or sanctioned you know, cars and RV parking. And, um, but that of course is not enough and there's still folks that are unsheltered and, and that's the whole point of our, our call tonight. And so uh, again, I'll defer to uh, my colleagues who are coming up next to describe this in more detail, but you know, the city has really taken a stance that we're trying um, to have a zero tolerance policy for encampments in the open space. And I think that's partly what's, um, you know, driving a little bit more encampment activity in other parts of the city. But uh, obviously, you know, you can look outside right now and see the air. There's a paramount concern about a wildfire um, that, that's coming from an encampment. So that's, that's a, a big part of the strategy. So um, with that, though, I am going to turn it over to our chiefs um, and let them describe a little bit about their perspective on this issue. I'll start with Chief White. And uh, Chief, just so you know, I do have um, the the slides you sent over. If you want to, if you want me to pull those up in the appendix, I can I can arrow over. We can cover those later. But but why don't we start with you, Chief White, and then we'll go to Chief Bishop. Absolutely. So um, first of all, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Darren White. For those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm the new San Rafael Fire Department Fire Chief as of about five and a half months ago, and. I'm really excited to be able to share with you a lot of information about some of the various things that we've been doing over the past few months since the approval of Measure C to ensure that the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority is able to actually um, deliver on its promise. Uh, we've had individuals working hard from the onset uh, as soon as the measure passed all the way until such time that we were able to access some of the funding to work on so many different things to draw down risk in our communities, whether it be in the open spaces, whether it be uh, in a variety of areas that are wildland urban interface, 
uh, areas of concern and prioritization for us. And so <clears throat> my vegetation specialist, uh, Inspector Sean Rule, provided me with a few of the maps that can show uh, some of the areas where we've been working as uh, what we consider high hazard or high threat and high priority areas. So Andrew, if you're able to move to the first slide, that's a color slide, um, I'll be able to speak to some of the work that's been done in that area. Um, actually, if you can bypass that one and go to this one, uh, that one's good. Yes, absolutely. Or this one. Uh, the other one just behind okay. the first. There you go. That one there. Okay, so this slide uh, depicts an area that I'm going to speak to specifically about Mar Mountain Park and the San Ra Rafael Hill. And this is an area where we've actually done extensive saw work alongside the Coleman Drive and behind Graceland Drive, which is outlined in the kind of a teal and a evergreen color, uh, kind of a zigzag in those areas, kind of a thin strip, as you can see behind the homes there. Um, the AmeriCorps St. Louis crews are, they're very skilled crews. They come in with the ability to use power tools and they really get a lot accomplished in a relatively short period of time. They returned back to St. Louis right around August 1st, but we were um, very happy that they're gonna be returning towards the end of this month to continue on with the great work that they're doing. They'll also be supplemented by another NCCC crew coming out of Sacramento who has less skills, but yet will be able to deliver some much needed work using loppers and doing pruning and other um, potentially disaster service work and others. So um, this is a very, another versatile crew, but more uh, geographically closer to us than those. And so with that, um, if you continue to look further down on Robert Dollar Drive, in that area that's kind of outlined in a kind of a brownish root beer color, you'll be able to see that um, the AmeriCorps crews also worked in those areas to remove ladder fuels. And that actually made it easier for the goat grazing to take place where a lot more work could get done because the AmeriCorps crews actually set the conditions for the um, goat grazing activities there to actually flourish a lot better than it would have been without their help. So that's one area I'm gonna speak to. The next area that may be of interest to the group. Uh, Andrew, if you can move to the next slide, that was, that's it there, thank you. Yeah. This speaks to the Dominican and Black Canyon area. And if you take a look at this entire perimeter here, this is a substantial amount of effort that uh, I'm really excited to see that we were able to get this amount of work in. I'm gonna give you a brief description of the work that took place there. So along the fire roads surrounding the Dominican Black Canyon area, AmeriCorps St. Louis again was able to work roughly a 30 to 50 foot off of the Aquinas Drive location down on your lower left on the screen to where the trail meets the Skitrini Fire Road and San Pedro Ridge. So um, <clears throat> the, the intent is for when AmeriCorps St. Louis returns in a few weeks, they're gonna continue that work and that work will continue on San Pedro Ridge Fire Road through Bay Hills and Gold Hill. And we'll also be able to explore the options with Dominican University and reevaluate with them how they manage their property that backs up to some of the homes in the area that, that are adjacent to their property. So really excited about the amount of work that we're able to get accomplished with the AmeriCorps St. Louis crews. And I've got to give a lot of credit to one individual in particular right now. I don't think she's on the line, which is Quinn Gardner, because she has a great working relationship with AmeriCorps. And because of this, we're able to get them out, um, really making a difference in our community year after year, season after season. And so uh, this is a great opportunity for those youth who are participating, but it's also a great thing for the results they achieve for our community and our risk reduction. Um, if we go to the other two screenshots, Andrew, if you can share the information. Um, yes, that's, that's one. I don't know that I really want to speak to that one so much. Um, yeah, I'll take just a, a brief description of what I'm seeing with these other two screenshots, especially in the, uh, the greenish and purple areas. Um, these screenshots come from our ARC GIS web builder and the city's GIS specialist, Zach Barron. They built this information for Sean and Matt Urias to basically um, contribute to an, an update and maintain over time. The green polygons that you're looking at indicate where the city owns or manages the land, the parks in the open space. The purple polygons overlay some of those areas to depict where the goats and or mechanical clearance have taken place over the past year and a half. So at some future point, uh, the goal is to have a version of this map available to the public. 
and it will feature things like the acres that have been treated, where the projects are planned to be uh, completed, and when they are actually completed. And this will have a, a visual record for, for folks to be able to reference. Um, the last item that, unfortunately, um, Andrew, if you want to pull that up with all the red dots on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is a, a version of a map depicting hotspots where, uh, unfortunately, we've had over the course of a five-year period reported ignitions in those areas. And so emergency reporting uh, actually provided us from their software this information. So it kind of gives you an idea as to where the, the challenging or the history has been over the last five years. And so I just I thought that was interesting to see and, and, and reference, but uh, fortunately, a lot of this seems to be closer to the 101 corridor as opposed to in some of the areas that we would um, ultimately have significant concerns about. Um, with that, I want to also share um, just the idea or some background and other information about what the department has been doing in addition to the use of AmeriCorps crews uh, and the gold grazing that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, we've been partnering with the FireWise or FireSafe Marin to try to establish chipper days in some of the lesser served areas of the community as well as those FireWise communities. And there's been a substantial effort there. Uh, a lot of chipper access, some chipper access in Marinwood as well. We, for the first time this year, had the benefit uh, upon my arrival, I learned that we had several thousand parcels that we weren't really getting eyes on every year just by virtue of not having sufficient staff. And so uh, I spoke with the San Rafael Fire Department Association president about my goal of having our engine and truck company personnel go out and do windshield surveys in their districts to kind of identify and speak to areas they had of concern with properties that may have not been in compliance. They're not doing a full inspection. It was just an assessment, if you will, and report that information back to our defensible space inspection staff that we were able to hire through MWPA funding. And so those inspectors thus far have gotten through roughly a third of the parcels and they're not even halfway towards the amount of time that they're allocated to be here. So we're really thrilled about their effort and that the forest multipliers that those engine and truck company assessments are providing helps to kind of guide and align and prioritize some of the work that those inspectors are doing right now. Uh, in addition, we've um, put in place a wildfire mitigation specialist uh, job announcement. We're looking to actually get some other individuals staffed in that area that can be available for public education purposes, for um, working with staff year round regarding our, our community risk reduction in areas of the wildland urban interface and wildfire mitigation and in support our, of our recently approved wildfire prevention and protective action plan that has made it through council and um, is actually a document that we're gonna be working on top of this, all the work that's been done to get new ordinances approved and updated and ensure that we continue the, the important work of drawing down risk in our community. Um, there's an evacuation effort, uh, or at least a conversation underway. Uh, I'll be bringing uh, a company that I'm familiar with named Zone Haven to present at our Marin County Fire Chiefs Association in two weeks. And they're gonna share information about a product that they're using in a variety of uh, nearby counties, such as um, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, Alameda County, where I came from, uh, Contra Costa County and others, which we believe will be a very useful tool to, to provide individuals with potentially real-time information about suggested routes for evacuation using their information and GIS um, that's updated on an ongoing basis. In fact, from what I understand, the, the Zone Haven personnel were down in the Santa Cruz area working with CAL FIRE during some of the recent evacuations down there. So this is um, some, some basically uh, encouraging developments on how we can use technology to assist us with our evacuation planning and or actual evacuations. Um, and so those are just several of the things that I thought would be of interest to the group. Um, if there's any questions, I'm certainly uh, hopefully able to answer the question to the surface. Thank you. Perfect. That was great, Chief. Thank you. Um, and why don't I, we'll go back here to the, the pictures. Uh, Chief uh, Bishop, do you want to add anything? Uh, just a little bit. One, my picture is a long time ago and I look really young. I'm not sure what happened, <laughs> but that's another conversation. And I, I just wanted to um, say we're happy to be part of this meeting and I'm, I'm really happy to have both Lynn and Carl Huber from our department 
to explain um, what our department does in, in mitigation of homeless encampments in our open space and, and our very um, active role in that, especially since Measure C passed and we were able to hire a full-time ranger, which we had never had. And we have a half-time ranger as well. So Sergeant Huber will talk to you about all the work that has been done and will continue to be done and what our focus is to, to keep um, our community safe, especially from wildfire danger. That's obviously a uh, forefront right now. So thanks. Sorry, I muted myself and then <laughs> couldn't get the screen back up. Uh, so why don't I turn it over to um, Lynn and Carl. And so um, here we were hoping to just get a more general update on some of the hot spots that we're dealing with. Obviously some of the, the sites that uh, prompted you all to join tonight uh, and just hear a little bit about what's being done and uh, what can be done and, and, and what the plan is moving forward. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start Andrew. Hello all, thank you. Uh, thank you Chief for the introduction and thank you everyone for allowing us to be able to present tonight on uh, this very important issue facing our community. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking uh, Chief White uh, due to a lot of the efforts of the fire department in the open space with regard to vegetation management and maintaining of uh, the fire roads and a lot of the hills. It really has uh, increased our ability to get to a lot of the places that uh, are very difficult to get to if these these uh, areas are not maintained. So let me introduce myself. I'm I am the uh, supervisor in charge of the special operations unit uh, for the San Rafael Police Department. Uh, I currently have two footbeat officers that are primarily downtown, and as Chief uh, Bishop mentioned, we have two uh, open space rangers, one uh, part time and one full time. Our open space rangers are primarily responsible for patrolling uh, the outlying areas in San Rafael uh, that are a major concern for us with regard to wildfire danger. Um, currently, they, um, they began in earnest in July when we received funding from Measure C to, to uh, engage in this effort. And to date, they have um, found and basically cleared out over 160 campsites with over 60,000 pounds of debris associated with those campsites in our open space. Um, three major areas that we are concerned with are the area of Cordesuela Hill, which is at the uh, top of Villa Avenue, uh, near the uh, Villa Avenue on-ramp, and, and actually uh, ex extends back into the Black Canyon Dominican neighborhood neighborhood area and above it. Uh, we also look at San Rafael Hill um, and basically because of its proximity downtown, it is pretty much a major area for encampments for us and including uh, Gerstle Park as well. That's a, a large area of open space that is, is close to downtown. So primarily we found this season most of our campsites on San Rafael Hill. Uh, we have, we found a couple uh, in on Portisuelo Hill, but what we've realized this year, for some reason, um, that area does not seem to be, uh, for whatever reason, very attractive for encampments. Uh, we've noticed that, uh, that a lot of the trails that we have traditionally seen encampments on are now overgrown and almost impassable. Um, that does not uh, prevent us from actually being up there and checking for campsites. We do so on a regular basis. I know our rangers uh, patrol that area on the, in the fire roads in the uh, walking trails and look for signs of encampments at least weekly. Um, included in some of our uh, campsite efforts uh, is an element of outreach. Um, the population that we're talking about are very service resistant. Uh, we do consistent outreach whenever we do a campsite clearing operation to try to get these individuals engaged in services of um, who's part of this effort and has done a great amount of work and it is our mental health liaison Lynn Murphy and I will defer to her to talk about some of the, the things that we've done um, in regards to that effort. 
Uh, right. Andrew, when can we have questions? Uh, Lynn is our last uh, our last presenter here, and so we're gonna after we hear from Lynn, we're gonna uh, turn it over for questions. Okay. Yeah. I will keep it brief, Jack. Um, right. So, as Carl said, I'm the mental health liaison for the department. I've been here for seven years, and my job is to do outreach and engagement with not only people who are homeless, but also the um, the nonprofits and health and human services and the housing authority to create connections between the people that are most in need of services and the agencies that can provide those services. Um, one thing that I really wanna highlight is that uh, the people that we're talking about that are in these campsites are really um, the most complex in the homeless population. Um, the layers of you know, trauma, physical disability, mental health issues, and substance use make these individuals particularly difficult to engage with. And for the most part, the people that are in these encampments have been homeless at least five years and upwards to 20 years. So um, I go out to Boyd Park at least once a week, and I do wanna just highlight one one component about Boyd Park, which is I know that it's the people that are staying there right now are highly visible and their property is visible. Um, and that is because they're not up on um, up on the hill, um, really deep into the brush. So although it does appear much more unsightly, having them down on the hill uh, in Boyd Park is probably safer. And um, one of the individuals who has been living in San Rafael, um, who's what we call an anchor, he's uh, one of the um, father figures to the homeless community. He's uh, 51 years old. Um, he has resisted any attempts at help from me or from other providers for the last seven years, the, at least the seven years that I've been working and he's been homeless here for 15 to 20 years. Um, just last month, he finally agreed to engage with services. He signed um, releases of information. He did the intake paperwork um, to do an assessment tool that is the very first step to getting into housing. And research has shown that when some of the people that are the most service resistant um, who act as anchors in the community, once they start to engage with services, then other folks will start to engage as well. So I'm, I'm feeling optimistic that because this one individual is now starting to engage that we might get others. Um, and I am wholly sympathetic to the neighbors of Boyd Park, um, having to see what's, what's going on you know, in your backyard. I can imagine it's, it's um, difficult to live to see that on a regular basis, but we are actively um, reaching out and trying to get these folks into permanent supportive housing. And I think we can move on. Well, that's it for me, Andrew. Okay, great. Thank you, Lynn. So uh, with that, I am opening it back up to um, the gallery and we are gonna be, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're going to start by, if you can, try to, uh, for the next, let's say, 10 to 15 minutes, um, type your questions in the chat, and then I will um, direct them to, to the right person. Um, Edith did get the first question in. She emailed it in, so I wanted to, to, to honor that and make sure we answered her question. Um, I don't have it directly in front of me, Edith, but I, I believe the, the thrust of it was, who is what? What level of government is is truly responsible for this issue? And it's a, it's a good question, and I know it's something that I think frustrates a lot of community members. I think when when folks reach out to the city or whoever it is, you know, you're, you're wanting that that issue resolved. Um, and I think what makes homelessness so complicated is that um, it requires many levels of government. And so actually, before COVID, uh, Governor Newsom had created a uh, statewide task force that included Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg, as well as LA County Board of Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas. They were co-chairing it. 
And um, I believe they were actually moving towards recommending a constitutional amendment that would require communities to actually do something about addressing homelessness. I think COVID is, has redirected the, the focus of that group, but I would say locally, um, if you go back a couple years, uh, four or five years, um, the, the, there was a lot of finger pointing between the city and the county. And the result was that nothing was happening. And the reality is that the city, we have the police department, the fire department, public works. We, we are in a very reactive position for this. And uh, the county with health and human services um, has most of the social services. So um, we've come together and I think we're trying to, I, I can honestly say we're working more closely than ever, um, but there is no like one entity that holds it. I think it's, that's what makes it so complex is that we have to come together to work on it. So uh, I wanted to address that first, Edith. Um, so moving into questions, uh, the first question I received is, um, uh, let's see. Um, so one question came in about the, actually unrelated to some of the encampments that sparked this meeting, but the growing issue under 101. Uh, there's an encampment under the Central San Rafael um, viaduct, uh, and that has become, I know I think that's on next door again, um, about the bike parts and, and things like that. So um, I will maybe, Carl, do you want to handle that first? Um, and then we can see if anyone else wants to, to update. Yes. Um, so we, yes, we are very much aware of um, the issue that is under the Central Center Fell Viaduct. Um, unfortunately, that is uh, state property. Um, we're not precluded from enforcing uh, criminal law in that area. However, we are precluded from enforcing campsite removals from that area. Um, we are very familiar with a couple of the individuals that are, uh, have set up shop there. Um, and I know that it's been of great concern to the community. Uh, I've answered some questions via email uh, to a resident uh, earlier this week regarding that. And some of the points that um, I would like to share, because I know it's, it's frustrating to think that something like this exists and that it appears to be um, very much a location of criminality. Um, what we're seeing is uh, some individuals that have a propensity to hoard a lot of discarded items. Um, the, as you know, there are a couple of different uh, bike shops around that area. And I'm not saying that some of the bicycles are from there, but I, have, I suspect that they are. Uh, when it comes to stolen bicycles, uh, I know that, that it seems like it's fairly obvious that certain ones are. However, um, what we find is that um, often it's difficult to, for us to prove that a bicycle is stolen because there, uh, may, there oftentimes is not a recording of a serial number by the owner of a bicycle. So when we go to a bicycle theft report, we're unable to get a serial number that would be able to track that particular bicycle. Um, often people just, just don't record them. Uh, I think we found that a lot of people, depending on the value of the bicycle stolen, may not have reported it as well. Um, unfortunately, when a bicycle is stolen in our community, uh, if it is um, stays within the community, we will see that bicycle change hands several times and also be uh, changed very quickly in appearance because it's taken apart and put back, put back together in, amongst several different ones. So we'll often find that an individual who has, well, ultimately is a stolen bicycle may have purchased that bicycle from someone who purchased it from someone else. So what we run into is this ability to prosecute somebody for the actual crime of possession of a stolen bicycle or bicycle theft. I'm not saying that it is impossible. We have had instances where we've been able to prove that and we've been able to get probation uh, clauses for people to that uh, prevent them from even possessing a bicycle and we do enforcement in that route. With regard to the cleanup operation that would have to take place under the viaduct, we would need to work with Caltrans and we are um, working with the state to try to, to get some traction on getting an operation to get that together. Um, it's, it's not going to be something that's extremely short term. It's going to take some time because um, this is uh, 
property that has does belong to the state. So we're aware of it. Uh, we're doing what we can, and we do enforce criminal law under in those areas. However, with regard to trying to take people from those areas uh, or, or to prevent camping, um, that is something that we've been given clear direction on the state, and we're advocating to try to change. But that is uh, not within our power at this point. To, to add to that, just so everyone's aware, and it, and it goes back to Edith's original question about you know what jurisdiction of government. Um, so typically in the past, we've been able to work pretty closely with um, CHP and Caltrans to address these issues that are on state property. Um, as of, uh, I guess, really two months ago, we've been informed that Caltrans, and this is direct from the governor's office, um, just so everyone's aware, the CDC at the beginning of Shelter in Place put out guidance to the uh, to all communities across the country that no homeless encampments at all should be cleared because of the possibility of uh, transmitting COVID into the community as people scattered from an existing site. Um, that's a policy that actually other communities in Marin are even sticking to. Um, and even in light of some, some pretty major consequences of that, that's something that the city has not endorsed at all. We have continued to, uh, as you heard at, from the beginning of the year, we've cleared over uh, or about 160 encampments that are on city property. This was the crux of the issue with the Villa Ave uh, encampment that if anyone here is, is calling in from the Dominican neighborhood, that was state property. So just this morning, we had a, finally had a call with Senator McGuire. Um, we totally hear everyone here, their frustration about what's going on. Uh, we relayed that to Mike. Uh, he is uh, planning to follow up with the, the general manager or whoever the, the district manager is for Caltrans for the entire Bay Area um, to hear out these concerns, um, especially around the fire risk. And then also, obviously, as these encampments grow in size uh, under these freeway off ramps, on ramps, um, they create hazards, obviously, for the public, as well as our law enforcement and uh, first uh, emergency responders. So, so that is in motion and, and talking to him. Um, just to get to more questions, uh, there seems to be kind of an initial series of questions about what, what exactly happens when a, a campsite is found in the open space. Uh, and then there's also a question about um, flammable objects and what can we do about that? Are people taking gas cans up into the open space? Um, Carl, maybe I'll turn it back to you. And then also, Nira, if you want to weigh in as well, just about kind of you know, our, our general policy and, and the legality of what we can do and are doing. Okay, when it, when it comes to campsites in open space, uh, typically what happens is if we locate one, if we find somebody in that campsite, we will give them a 24 hour notice to vacate. If we find the campsite unoccupied, we give them a 72 hour notice to vacate. So it gives them the opportunity to come back to the campsite, see the notice and remove their property from the open space. Um, the reason why we do this is we are constrained by uh, a number of case law that restricts us from being able to just seize property. And it gives the, the person the opportunity to collect their personal belongings and those things that they're going to need for their daily lives to, to be able to live their lives. When it comes to combustibles, whether it's um, something that looks like um, a pile of wood that has been going to be used for cooking or a warming fire, we will, we will seize that. We will seize propane tanks immediately. We will seize gas cans immediately. We will seize lighters. Anything that's going to be a source of ignition, um, we will take immediately without, without notice. And we do leave a notice for that person that we have that property because they are entitled to it should they want it back. But they are, uh, we will not tolerate having that in open space because it presents too much of a risk. So with regard to our, our process and our procedure, that, that is what we have to follow where we are constrained by law in order to do that. You must you, because of state law, is that what requires you to give people a 24 hour notice? There has been several case laws that have, have come down um, out of Fresno and Los Angeles where the jurisdictions were seizing property uh, without notice and they, they face sanction for it. So generally speaking, 24 to 72 hours um, is the acceptable term of time to give somebody to remove their property, uh, given those, those cases. Thank you, Carl. Nira, anything worth adding or? 
Yeah, I would, I would add that with respect to that property that the city must provide notice for before confiscating or removing, that does not apply to um, property that is in violation of any law. So that would mean um, the city could indeed confiscate any drug paraphernalia, could confiscate violent weapons if they are um, not permitted in, in the location in which they're found. The city could also confiscate um, any fire uh, hazard related materials. And, and, doing, and doing so, would, the city could do so without providing notice. Um, another question that came up is, you know, what is, what is the burden on San Rafael specifically versus other communities? Um, one thing that I did include in the presentation, but I think is really worth noting is that, um, you know, a few years ago before we really embarked on this chronic homeless focus, as I said at the beginning, there was a lot of problems with our downtown providers. And obviously we still have downtown service providers and, and that's something that we're still working on, on, you know, finding relocation opportunities. But two really major things happened um, which included, uh, specific to the Ritter Center, is that they used to provide, you might have heard of, of this 16 Ritter Street address. Basically, they had kind of honestly lost control over the mail service. That was basically the homeless mail service for the county. And so people were coming from all over to get, you know, whatever they needed at the Ritter Center. It was driving a lot of traffic downtown. That service has been eliminated at that site. It's been moved to a PO Box service that's not downtown. Um, that's had a huge impact in terms of reducing some of that flow downtown, as well as honestly some of the, the transient activity, even though that's a minority of the homeless community, um, there was certainly some of that. We've also um, ended, eliminated the shower service that used to be at the Ritter Center. That was serving about 300 people a week. That has moved to a mobile program that is now, uh, there's still service in San Rafael, but it's in Novato. It's operating in Sausalito, Fairfax. Um, so we've made that a, a countywide program as well. Um, and as I mentioned too during the presentation, for those 200 plus people that we've housed, those are not people, even if they were homeless in San Rafael, they're not exclusively housed in San Rafael. In fact, most people are being housed in other parts of the county, Novato, Mill Valley, San Anselmo, Larkspur. Um, so, so it really is a, a countywide issue. And I, I do want to just reiterate again that San Rafael right now actually I think has the most um, proactive stance on addressing encampments countywide. Just yesterday, there was a fire in Novato at an encampment that now has two dozen people. So um, that is something that fortunately we're not facing. Uh, and it's because we have been more proactive than I would say any other community. Um, let's see, there's some questions about maybe prevention of people going into the open space, fencing, um, any, any comments anyone wants to make on that? Anything we can do around prevention of going to the open space? Um, Andrew, I know that I think it was last year or the year before we had such a fire danger with red flag warnings that we actually um, closed open space for everyone because of you know just the, the risk of, of people being up there during this time and something inadvertent happening. And we did that, and, and after we did that, we kind of recognized that fire danger is probably gonna be all year round in, in California these days, mostly. And we then took the stance, the city took the stance that no encampments would be allowed at any time or sleeping at any time during the open space, in the open space. And that is um, us carving out a, a piece of a, a law that I would like, or a case law that I'd like Nero to discuss, Martin versus Boise, which is, is a, a difficult thing to um, balance between safety and, and the this, this court decision about not criminalizing people uh, sleeping on public property, but no one can camp or sleep in the open space. The open space is for people walking their dogs and taking a hike and reflecting. And we are very, with the resources we have, that is the thing that the, the rangers do. So I just wanted to, Say that, and if Nira, if you could just give a, a real overview of Martin versus Boise and and what uh, municipal cities that have to deal with because of that. Yeah, no problem, Chief Bishop. So the case that the chief was just referring to is a case that came out of uh, Idaho, in Boise, a few years ago. And in Boise, um, the city had adopted an ordinance that criminalized sleeping in all public places. 
Um, that included sidewalks, that included parks, that included any time of day and any time of night. And a group of uh, person, people experiencing homelessness sued the city and said that the ordinance violated the Eighth Amendment and the court, the Ninth Circuit, which governs California as well, ultimately agreed with those people. And the reasoning that the court provided was that absent adequate alternatives, cities may not impose complete bans on sleeping in public places. And what the ruling ultimately meant for all cities in the, in the Ninth Circuit, including San Rafael, is that the city cannot enact a complete ban of sleeping in public absent viable um, alternatives such as readily available shelter beds. What the city can do under Boise is uh, determine certain places in the city that are prohibited um, as to sleeping during the night or during the day. And what Chief Bishop mentioned is that the city has determined uh, on a policy level that sleeping in open space, sleeping on sidewalks and sleeping in the street ra uh, raise grave enough health and safety risks that the city can never uh, during the day or at night authorized sleeping or camping in those locations. But because the city does not have sufficient um, and readily available shelter beds, the city cannot prohibit sleeping altogether in public places. And what that means for us in San Rafael is that because the city is, has determined that sleeping in uh, open space and sleeping in, in sidewalks and streets is uh, too risky for the public at large, there will be sleeping in other public places throughout the city. Um, and that has to be in public property. And again, that's not a law that the city came up with. That is a law that the Ninth Circuit established um, in Martin versus Boise decision. Um, there are some questions in the thread that sort of just hit on I think just the, the general frustrating behavior of some folks in the homeless community around drug use, around property crime and things of that nature. Um, what I would maybe just say on that note is, is again, the reality of our situation is that in Marin and across the entire state, there is only shelter for about 30 to maybe 40% of people that need it. And with COVID, obviously that's gonna get worse even despite the fact that we've added shelter. Um, we've found that really focusing on housing is the solution for those problems. Um, a lot of communities in the past have just waited for people to resolve those issues and they just don't resolve. And so uh, a study came out just uh, last week from UCSF that looked at, it was actually basically like a medical level trial of uh, a group of the most, the highest utilizers, you know, substance users, behavioral health challenges in Santa Clara County, Half of the group randomly through a lottery got assigned to housing first. The other half didn't get an intervention. And at the end of the study, uh, I think it was close to 90% of people that received the housing were still inside. And they had seen the kind of reductions in service utilization that we talked about earlier. Of the other group, only about a third had ended up in a housing um, intervention that was that was working for them. So, so that that remains the plan. Um, and so you know, again, it's very frustrating. I, I see in particular, uh, Mariah, I, I can tell you're, you're, you're very frustrated about it, understandably. Um, and so we're really, I, I can tell you again, that our strategy is focused on those individuals. Um, and that's where all of our service providers are focused. It's where the city's focused, the county's focused. Um, and that, that really is um, I, I, our biggest priority. Whereas in the past, it was not. And frankly, it's not the, the strategy in a lot of communities. And they're seeing their numbers increase and they're seeing the problem get worse. And so uh, we're not where we want it to be, but uh, we definitely hear the concern and, and, and have prioritized it. Um, the, other, the other kind of comment that came up is, um, and again, I think this is something, Mariah, that you raised was, was around relocation or, or creating a housing in other communities. Um, we had looked at opportunities for uh, relocating Ritter, I think one opportunity was back in 2016, actually. Uh, and, and again, we, we saw, you know, just very intense opposition from the community, even within San Rafael for, for relocation. So that's something we continue to work on with Ritter. 
Um, they actually have a, yet another property that they've been eyeing, but they're just waiting for the, the timing on a potential purchase. Uh, and again, that would all be a fully public process for the community to weigh in on, but, but that, that search has not stopped, I can assure you. Um, okay, 657, um, are there any other questions? Uh, I think everyone's live on the, the call, but anyone want to just ask something in the final minutes? Or? Yes. On behalf of the 950 homes in Dominican, I have to speak up and say, we are so concerned about fire hazards from the encampment about the potential of fire from the encampments. And I can't find that you are saying anything that can really prevent it. What do you think? Can you stop this from, can you stop these encampments? I mean, I, I, I don't know if maybe the chiefs want to weigh in, maybe, maybe Chief White, but I, I mean, I'll just say on the front, I mean, as long as there are unsheltered people in our community, there's going to be some level of encampment activity. And I think the well, okay. we're taking is, is trying, and you heard a lot of, a lot of strategies and activities tonight to prevent encampments in high fire risk areas. That, that is the number one priority for the city. So while we can't have patrols that are preventing people from going up there, we, there is a lot of proactivity. There's a lot of proactive action to monitor, to go up there, to look for people, to remove them, to remove flammable objects, uh, to, to do other fire suppression uh, interventions. Chief, did you want to add anything? Uh, absolutely. Um, Mr. Nixon, to your question, um, first of all, I, I certainly understand and, and empathize and share your concerns. Uh, as Andrew and uh, Sergeant Hubert and others spoke to earlier, we are working uh, diligently with the state to try to have them understand our concerns. And I think those concerns we have here are, are shared in many other areas throughout the state. And so I just want everybody to understand we're not dealing with this alone, but part of the criteria that they look at as to whether or not something is really a imminent threat to public safety is a, is a major concern. And so whereas I've articulated that I believe that these encampments are an imminent threat to public safety, that definition may not um, sit very well with others who are deciding whether or not this is something we can take action upon based on whether they determine this is a, uh, an imminent threat to public safety. And so we all know that right now, um, anytime there is a flammable or there's the potential for something to happen in the wildland urban interface, particularly during red flag day, such as the conditions we're experiencing now, um, or you know when mother nature decides to start a fire as she's done over the last uh, couple of months, these are imminent threats to public safety. Um, and so until we get that definition modified, I think we're gonna to continue to face some of these challenges and trying to, to have this defined as such where we can take definitive action. But we're, we're doing everything in our power to articulate the concern uh, because it is serious. We are concerned and we wanna make sure we're advocating as emphatically as we can on behalf of our, our communities. And so just know that we see and we recognize the problem and we're working as hard as we can to, to get this resolved. I appreciate that, Chief. Uh, I'm probably the only one on the screen that watched the fire behind my house, which went all the way up and down Locust Avenue. And it's not on your map. It happened so long ago. It was set by a homeless man on purpose because we wouldn't give him, we being all the neighbors, would not lend him the tools to build his own lean-to or whatever up there. And so we looked out our back window to see where the fire engines were, and we saw a huge sheets of flame as far as we could see. So that's why I'm concerned. We, we definitely hear that. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Um, so with that, it's, it's 701. I, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to, to join tonight. This is obviously not a one and done. This is uh, an ongoing conversation. We've been communicating, obviously, you know, for in some cases years on this issue. And, and this is, again, not the end. And we're, we're happy to continue to, to have conversations and, and think about strategies. And, and there's some creative ideas that have been mentioned in the chat as well. Um, so uh, again, I, th I think we've really tried to be um, responsive when we can to, if you see people that are, you know, that we, we haven't seen or, or you suspect activity, please reach out to us and, and we'll obviously investigate right away and, 
and and within our our powers to um, to keep the community safe. That's a that's a shared goal for us as well. So, um, thank you again. And uh, again, feel free to reach out. Um, we're we're here. Thank you all very much for your help and for your guidance. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.